Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, it's time for a product teardown, not a product review. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a product which, I've, which I really like, I've liked for a long time. I think it's some really great engineering in it. We're going to take it apart, see how it works, check out why, it's, why I think it's so good, and then we're going to hack it, mod it, to get better performance. Should be fun. And here it is. This is what we're going to tear down. This is the Princeton Tech EOS headlamp. Now, I think it's one of the best, if not the best, um, headlamp in its class on the market. I don't think you can do any better. Now it's been around for a long time. It's probably probably been around for I don't know or oh, the best part of a decade I think and they still sell it and it's still one of the best headlamps on the market. Now I use this headlamp for my canyoning because it's waterproof um, and I use it for all my other adventure activities and I think it's one of the best uh, headlamps in its class on the market. Um, it's 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 not cheap. It's you know it's thirty five forty dollars. I know you can buy cheap crap headlamps on eBay for five bucks with fifty LEDs in them and things like that. But they're just utter utter garbage. They really are. You get what you pay for for about thirty five. US dollars, it's much more expensive here in Australia, but uh, in the US, 35 bucks, and I reckon it's the best headlamp you could get. Now, there are many things I like about this. I like the fact that it's small, it's light, uh, it's waterproof to one meter, and um, it's, it's got O-ring seals, it's powered by three AAA batteries, it's all self-contained, it's, it's got a nice headband, and it's made using impact-resistant polymer plastic casing, and that makes it real tough and rugged, and it's got a one watt um, Luxian slash Kingbright slash something else LED in it, and uh, that's what we're going to upgrade. And one of the great things about this headlamp is that it's made in the USA. It's not made in China or anywhere else. It's made in the US, and Princeton Tech have put a lot of design effort, as we'll see, into this, and I really love it. Now, one of the reasons that I'm so keen to upgrade this headlamp, while I love it, um, I think it's it's not really suited. Um, as well as it could be to my particular purposes. Now it's got a it's got a, a computer design whiz bang design focusing uh, lens in here, which is designed to throw the beam up to 50 meters, which is very impressive for a 50 lumen uh, one watt LED. Now um, I I would much rather um, because I'm not out spotting things in a tree 50 meters away when I'm out uh, doing adventure stuff I'm usually you know I want to see things five ten meters away at tops and I'd rather have a wider dispersed beam and a brighter beam one of the neat things about this headlamp is the different modes I know all headlamps have different modes these days but back when this first came out it was it was kind of a big deal you know to have a one watt LED with all these different modes and there's a there's a nice uh, rubber button on top here which is very hard to hit when it, when you pack when you put it in your pack and things like that I've never had it accidentally come on so it's really quite nice and it's got different modes you press it once which is it comes on high first of all and then you press it again after a certain time and it'll go off but if you press it multiple times that'll go to the second level and then a lower level and then it'll have a flashing level as well I really like the 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 fact that they've shaved these um, bits off here which makes it less bulky it really makes it lighter weight and it takes up less room in your pack now the other thing is it's got a tilting um, thing here they've built these little notches on the outside to snap into different orientations so it's when, you, when it's on your forehead you can tilt it up and down like that now they've actually uh, made, the, made this bit here rounded so that when you put it on your forehead because your forehead's not straight your forehead is round so they've made that round which is really neat and the other thing is, is that they've put this um, really nice, huge, big uh, thumb thing on here for undoing the batteries. You can undo it with, your, with just your fingers, or if you need to, you can get a big screwdriver or your fingernail or a bottle cap or anything like that in there. And it opens up, and there's the three uh, AAA batteries. Now, as you can see, it's got an O-ring seal all around the outside here, which is really quite nice. It's got reasonably... Uh, good surface finish here so if you actually grease up these o-rings it can actually be extremely uh, waterproof you'll see that it's held in with these two heat stakes here 
and here. Now, if you drill through those, it'll pop straight out. And it's, it's really quite neat. So we'll take it apart. But look at these extra ridges they've put in here. Now, they've done that to add strength um, while actually lighting in the weight, I would presume. They're, they're, they're not there for show. There's deliberately deliberate reasons why they've done that. And the hinge is actually reasonably good as well. It's got a solid metal pin straight through it in there. And it's just a really nice design, really excellent industrial design. It's lightweight, it's compact, and does exactly what you need. I really doubt you could make it a headlamp any more efficient with three double A's and a one watt LED. Okay, so I've just drilled out these two little heat stakes here, and it just pulls out like this as one complete module. It's really very elegant and very nice. Now, as you can see down here, internal to the case, integral, once again, held together with heat stakes, is, is the button. So you push the button on top and it pushes that little lever, which then pushes on a standard uh, PCB, mount, PCB mount uh, micro switch here. And there it is. And look at something else rather interesting here. Check out the, uh, the design of the plastic. They've added a little plastic shaft onto there in order to hold the switch in place. They've gone to a lot of trouble to think about stuff like that. And it's really neat. And you'll notice there are no screws on this design at all. They're, they're, once again, this PC, this top PCB is held in, is soldered with that solder point there and that one straight on to the battery contacts. Um, and there's no screws because these four heat stakes here, 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 and there actually hold the board onto the case. And that minimizes your uh, assembly cost and your assembly time and it's they've put a lot of uh, thought and a lot of effort into it now let's take off this um lens assembly here and as you can see it's a single um uh, nicely designed piece of uh sort of plastic acrylic or something something like that and that just sits right in there and this bit here comes off it's just held in with these four um four pillars here so it's all once again, there are no screws at all. It comes off, and bingo, there's the Luxian Star um, LED. Now, this is actually an older model headlamp. I'll show you a newer one in a minute. Now, one of the things you'll notice here is that the Luxian Star LED does not have any heatsink. It just sits down in there like that, but what it's got is uh, it's got, there's a thermistor. Check it out right under there to sense the heat from this thing to uh, to either regulate it or shut it off. But we'll um, do some circuit investigation to actually see uh, see how that actually works. Now, here's my original uh, headlamp, which I've had for many years. I've got a couple of them, um, and it's a slightly different design to this brand new one, which, I've, which I just got um, straight from the US. There, there are a slight few component differences on the board, but uh, not a huge amount, and the as you can see, the LED is actually different. This one's a, um, a opulent Rebel Star. It says it's a Rebel Star LED, and it's um, nothing printed on the bottom. The uh, lens is a bit too. This is the original one here, and this is the new one. It's like frosted, and it's slightly it's slightly different, but it's a you know essentially it's the same design. And once again, they've changed these um, uh, plastic holsters to match the um, to actually match the uh, LED they're using. This one's got a smaller aperture on it which um, could cause us a problem when we go to change our LED. But uh, yeah, the old one's much better in that respect. The other thing you'll notice about it is that the polycarb um, front lens protector is, is really embedded in the plastic in there and that's what um, gives it its inherent uh, waterproofness and toughness. It really is a tough and waterproof little headlamp. We're actually going to test to see whether or not this little thermistor actually regulates the constant current through the lead on, on like a, a continuous basis or whether or not it's just a hysteresis type, um, you know, uh, on off type protection device. So we're going to do that. We're going to switch it on to full brightness like that and we're going to apply the soldering iron and well, there we go. It dropped down to the next level. Okay, let's try the thermistor thing again, but with the 
current, but actually measuring the current. Bingo, there we go, it went down to 100. So it doesn't quite. Will it jump back up? No, there you go, it does. It almost does have a sort of semi continuous type effect there. Okay, well, let's actually measure the current in the different modes, shall we? On high, bingo, three, oh, 288. I expected about 350 milliamps actually, but um, it's only about 290 milliamps. And let's go to the second mode. 100 milliamps, yeah, that's 95 milliamps, that's pretty much what I expected. And the third and low mode is 25 milliamps, that's pretty much what I expected too. Okay, let's try and measure the efficiency of this DC to DC converter. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, he's a classic example of why every good lab needs at least four multimeters. Here I am, I've got uh, measuring the um, input voltage from the uh, supply I'm measuring the input current so we can from that we can work out the input power we've got the um, LED working on maximum brightness and here's the LED uh, current 290 milliamps and here's the LED voltage almost three volts so there you go that's a reason to have actually at least four let alone five because if I want to probe that circuit I now need a fifth multimeter this is a first stab at what's happening here. Here's ground is over here, okay, that's your ground input, and this is your positive input from the battery. Now, there's a diode here which goes off somewhere. There's a transistor here, Q something or other. Uh, there's, your, um, there's your main DC to DC um, converter inductor. Okay, so that's 100 micro henrys by the looks of it. And uh, there's your diode as well. There's the input smoothing cap that's obviously uh, going between there and um, presumably ground and the output from the inductor I can see the good thing about this board is that you don't really have to see the tracks on the bottom to know what's actually going on here it's really really quite neat um, so the output of the inductor is going to there so it's got a single transistor switch into an inductor presumably that transistor is driven by the um, IC and uh, what else have we got here? We've got the um, output um, smoothing cap as well here, and that goes right through to the negative rail of the um, lead here. So really, it's a very basic um, DC to DC converter. It's just a single transistor switch with an inductor and a diode and a and a smoothing cap because this. Uh, headlamp is actually a constant current mode. Each mode is supposed to have a constant current, which we'll check out later to see if it actually does. Um, now, these, uh, so, so to get that constant current, you actually need to have, a, you need for the, uh, you need for the IC to intelligently control the switch over here. That larger resistor there, you can tell that's a, um, current sense shunt resistor just by its size compared to all the others. I think they're actually um, separate range control transistors to get the different current ranges. Now I'm guessing that they're going to have a fixed current range and then they switch in a, a sense resistor somewhere here and all this stuff over here um, all this circuitry is just some sort of um, you know, voltage sense um, circuitry. This stuff up here probably goes from the thermistor into there, so that's like a, a, um, a over temperature detect circuit. And Here's a quick reverse engineer of the circuit. Now it may not be 100% correct because I only did it very quickly, so don't quote me on it, but I think it's pretty darn close because it's basically exactly what I expected. So here it is. You've got your battery input here which goes to a series diode, uh, which goes to a diode through a high value series resistor which powers the IC. You've got an input filter cap, and then you've got the input switching transistor, a diode, an inductor and a cap. And if you ignore the rest of this down here and you have this, if you had this going to ground, then that right there would be a classic buck uh, DC to DC converter, a buck step down converter. Absolutely textbook example of it. Now, um, but instead of just being that basic thing, instead of this going to ground, it goes into these current sense range resistors down here. And as, as I suspected, there's um, three different ranges and you've got two transistors to switch. So there's a permanent range 
branch down there, there's another range here, and there's another range here. And you can turn these transistors on in combinations to get uh, the low, medium, and high uh, brightness constant current ranges. Now, this is 3R9 here, so that's the highest value one, and it's fixed. So that's obviously the low range, and it switches in the combination of 0.33 ohms and or um, 3R in parallel with 2R2. So it um, so through a combination of those, they can get the three ranges easy. And then it's um, they take a sense uh, uh, tap off here, which goes into some sense circuitry, which I haven't really looked at, um, and it goes back into the IC. So the IC clearly controls the um, DC to DC. Uh, it it, can, it pulse ch controls the pulse width modulation on well on the gate here. Um, at, a, at a particular frequency to keep a constant current through this circuit. It's neat, it's elegant, and I like it. A more advanced circuit would have actually replaced the diode here with another switching transistor, and that would have been a uh, synchronous buck converter, which allows you higher efficiency, but it's, you know, in an LED headlamp, it's, it's probably not worth the effort. On the high range, I got 90.3% efficiency from the DC to DC converter. That's not bad for a, for a basic buck. And um, uh, medium range, I got 88%. Um, uh, so it's basically the same on the high and the medium ranges. And the efficiency, as to be expected on the low range, drops a bit. I get about 68% um, efficiency on the low range. But that doesn't matter. It's just the low range. So it's not bad at all. So if we're going to hack this thing and increase the brightness of the LED on um, any or all ranges, how do we do it? Well, it's obvious, and it was obvious before I even drew the circuit, because that large 0805 um, current sense resistor I pointed out, which is here, uh, 0.33 ohms, that's clearly the value for the high range. So all we have to do is, if we want to increase the brightness on the high range, just change the value of that resistor. And likewise on the other ranges as well, if you're not happy with those values. Simple. Or alternatively, you could muck around with the sense circuit perhaps, but that's not worth the effort. Just change the range value resistors and uh, to keep the constant voltage across there. So if you lower the value, it requires more current and um, it, you don't have to muck around or know anything about this sense circuit or how it works. Let's check out the driving transistor on the various modes. This is the low mode. It's about 574 kilohertz, as you can see, and it does uh, jitter and uh, jump around a little bit, showing that it's con continuously um, uh, adjusting that constant current. And this is high. We've got uh, around about uh, 56 kilohertz, and medium, we've got around 228 kilohertz. So we will correct that it adjusts the frequency uh, to maintain a constant current. Let's have a look at the LED output, shall we, on the different modes. This is the modified headlamp, and as you can see, there's not much ripple there at all. That's on high, medium, and low. All right, let's check out at what voltage the regulator actually drops out of constant current at, because that's important as the battery ages. Now, this is the battery uh, input voltage here, and this is the LED current. Now, I'm going to switch it to the middle range, which is the range I typically use it at, and let's wind down the battery voltage and watch the current to see where it drops out at. Still going. Now, we're down to about 1.1 volts per cell now, and it's still there, and it's going to drop out. Yeah, it starts to drop out at just over a volt per cell really. But uh, the good thing is, is that as the battery voltage keeps going down, you can see it doesn't just die. The lead just starts to dim and the current still kicks in there. So you're getting useful life right down to now where the lead is cut out at about, completely at about 2.3 volts. Nice. So as you saw there, the current regulation isn't really perfect because a perfect current regulator in this instance wouldn't would maintain that uh, constant current until the battery voltage is completely dead which for an alkaline cell is about uh, 0.8 to 0.9 volts or thereabouts so um, it continued to work down to under 0.8 but um, it didn't maintain it but that's a result of the simplistic 
uh, circuitry used really but it's not a bad performer at all it certainly uh, maintains that uh, down to about one volt per cell which is precisely what you want really so it's not bad design now you may be wondering why they chose the star mount LED. In fact, um, you may be thinking that, well, it was an obvious choice because it's an industry standard um, format. But really, if you're producing a headlamp like this, you cost margins at everything. So it would have been um, possibly, uh, it would have been much better for them to mount the LED directly onto the main PCB there. It would have been much more economical for them, um, less assembly because they wouldn't have to do the wires, you could possibly make it more compact because it's not stood off from the PCB like that and you could do heat sinking on the board and all sorts of advantages to doing that but they chose the star LED. Why? It's because they wanted to decouple the design from the main, the LED from the main PCB and that makes sense in the LED industry because these LEDs are constantly changing, changing uh, suppliers, they you know you might get a more efficient one or something like that and the footprints change but this star mount is pretty much an industry standard um, but it's, it's because it's decoupled you can uh, make changes later on in the design process or even after it's in production with no effect on your main PCB. Even though it's got extra cost in assembly and stuff like that, it has its advantages. So there's much more thought gone into selecting that star LED than you might imagine. I can picture, you know, them having lots and lots of Dilbert style meetings about this LED and should they mount it on the board or separately. So, I'm going to modify one with one of these new Cree XPG LEDs, the most efficient in the world pretty much I think. I've used them in a previous blog and I should be able to um, get about uh, 150 lumens out of this. Now the standard EOS headlamp is only uh, 50 lumens on the high mode. When we've modded the LED we've got the choice to either increase the current on the uh, various ranges or just leave it the same. You can just simply replace the LED because the new Cree XPG LED is a hell of a lot more efficient than the uh, older Luxian Kingbright one they're using. So, you know, just changing the LED alone is going to give you a, a, you know, a two and a half fold to almost three fold increase in brightness. But considering that I use my headlamp mostly on the medium or the low mode, I only use it on the high one occasionally, I think I'll just mod the high mode to give me um, some increased current, maybe uh, you know just the 350 to 400 milliamps instead of 290, and uh, that should be give me a useful high uh, burst mode when I actually need it. I ex totally expect the radiation pattern to change when I mod the headlamp, but that's good because I want a wider beam instead of a more focused beam. So just bodging up this, I'll get some loss. In, um, because it's not optimized for this particular LED, but the extra brightness in this LED will more than make up for it. Okay, here's a completely unscientific test in the garage here. Now, here's a standard Princeton Tech EOS headlamp on high. As you can see, there you can see the spot at the end there, and it it's really is a spot headlamp. It doesn't evenly light up the, um, the areas just in front of you. Now, compare that with the new modded one, Look at that, there's no spot at the end and it lights up either side, it lights up the cars on the side, which is really quite nice and what I need um, for really, uh, for canyoning and other outdoor work, it's really quite neat. Okay, let's try and compare the beam patterns on the wall. This is the standard Princeton Tech EOS, as you can see, it's got a really uh, bright centered spot. Now let's check out the new one. Check it out, it's uh, really, it is much, much more even. Let's try that one more time up closer now. And this one on the right is the previous Princeton Tech EOS and the one on the left is the new modified one. As you can see, quite a big difference. They're the same distance from the wall. And as you can see, there's a really a substantial difference in the beam patterns in these two lamps. I really like the new modern one, it's very nice.